ladies in waiting is and when you produced it and where you were in your writing career. It was a play that uh, started that had eleven actresses playing forty roles, and it was very much at the time. Um, this was a time when abortion was being abortion rights, uh, pro-choice rights were being challenged once again, and. Norma Corby, who was the original plaintiff in Roe vs. Wade, had come out, she was a uh, born-again Christian, and she came out and she said that she wished she had never taken on that case, and Sarah Weddington, who had been the lawyer who fought that case, was saying that, you know, she was very disappointed to hear that because it was a case that, a landmark case that changed women's lives, and so I remember feeling really sort of shaken by that and disappointed by that. And I had always wanted to be a writer. I had come to New York to be a playwright, which was kind of a, a daring move, I guess, at the time, because I'd left Texas and everything that I knew, and yeah. I, I didn't have a job, and I only had like $600. And well, playwriting. <laughs> playwriting, so I know you'll make it back in a heartbeat. That's right. And Why were you writing plays specifically? I grew up doing theater. Theater was kind of my, my place. Especially as a teenager, I did a lot of community theater. It was sort of like the place that I went that felt um, where, I, where I felt I belonged. And, um, like any weirdo. <laughs> exactly. This is where all the weirdos went. Totally. And funny myself. <laughs> did you? Did yeah. you do a lot of theater? Yeah, definitely. I was, I I was a terrible actor. Dolls. Except for there was one time, it was a student-written play I did in college, where I had to play a statue come to life. And that was, it was the only time I was any good. Because like being wooden was part of the role. <laughs> <laughs> natural. Eve is sitting on the edge of her bed. Eve being the original Eve. <laughs> Mitochondria. <laughs> you... In case she thought it was like Eve Harrington or something. <laughs> awesome. Uh, would you like to read the first page for us? Sure. Eve. Listen to that seal. You can hear it locking in freshness. That's an amazing Tupperware sound. <laughs> Good that's job. my specialty. That's, that's pretty much what I was going to do if I ever became an actor. So totally sell it yeah. or just open it and close no, it? No, just open it and close it. Or just make the sounds. A fair amount of your life is probably devoted to that now, having a, a son. <laughs> uh, what I really like here is that you have, it's such a sealed female environment um, that all these characters are women. And, um, and that you have, so, so you can, the idea of like, are we talking about what it means to be a woman is, is always right, bubbling under the surface since there is no like, male presence to diffuse it, um, which is actually common to a lot of your, a lot of your work. Um, a great and terrible beauty in a, That's true. a school full of, of just girls. Um, beauty queens, the plane that crash lands is filled exclusively with female beauty queens. Um, so what do, you, what do you think you're able to get out? Or what, what is the appeal for you in writing about exclusively female environments. There was a sense at that time I was feeling a little let down by the women's mm. movement. And I was kind of like, well, we're the next generation of the women's movement. You know, but it was, it was like having a party and everybody's leaving. You're like, guys, mm. guys, we've got we to gotta storm the castle. And then kind of going, do I even want to storm the castle? What am I going to get when I storm the castle? Is there food there? <laughs> is, is there food there? Or is, is I'm going to have to hit somebody with a tray? <laughs> so, but, so you have all these... these women that are just talking about sort of their perspective, these famous roles, and then you have someone worried about Tupperware at the same time. So you have this like, disconnect of the everyday sphere of, of being a, the domestic goddess, and then with all these different role models that you could follow or, or choose not to follow at the same time. Well, and I think, you know, the thing about, too, the Tupperware is, I mean, she is sort of, it, it, there is something kind of fun about Tupperware. And it, it was, it was, I mean, it, exactly what you said, but it was, it was also just the idea that, um, that there is something appealing about that role as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that she's so clearly reveling in it and having fun mm -hmm. with it, with that sort of domestic role. And, um, and I think that that is such a push-pull for women because on the one mm -hmm. hand, I mean, I find it a push-pull for myself. But there are certain things I got to do with Beauty Queens that I didn't get to do here. And some of that, and maybe part of it is the generational thing, because they're all teenagers. And so everything is open to them. But I think part of what, um, part of what was great was that they could be like, I, I, I mean, I jokingly call it lip gloss feminism. But it's like, yeah, okay, this is my, <laughs> this is my feminism 2.0, and I can, I can do it with lipstick. 
what do you think you've gotten right now that when you were younger you might not have even realized you were doing wrong in your writing? I think that there was a tendency in, in my writing when I was younger to want to really explain everything and to explain it a lot and then again and then perhaps on this page and then perhaps with the reindeer. It was just there was a lot of repetition. I don't think I trusted the audience and the reader as much as I do now. Now yeah. I'm kind of like, you know, there are things that don't need to be said. Mm. And um, mm. and it's it's funny because I think there were things, sometimes the things that did need to be said in the writing, those are the things that I would run away from. And I think that was the deeper emotional stuff. Mm -hmm. So I was I was much more skittish. I didn't quite know how to like sit with something and and really dig around in the guts of it mm. and put out the emotional stuff and instead I tended to over explain the stuff that was like yeah we we got that mm. you know it's just like if you're watching a film I, I think this is one of the things I love about film mm -hmm. is how an actor with just his expression could say three pages of dialogue mm. right yeah, I think Michael Cunningham, when he saw the first cut of The Hours, there was this, he was talking about how Meryl Streep has this wonderful moment when she's taking an egg and she's trying to re remove the white. I don't cook, but she's just getting the yolk. Um, and so she's like playing it from hand to hand. And he just described her gestures that it respect, reflected so much of her character, like the, the quick snap. And she's having a conversation while she's doing it. And that it just it conjured so much of the character in a way that would have been wasteful in prose. Were you, not that your footnotes were explanatory in Beauty Queens, but were you leery of putting any in, just as a structure? I I wasn't leery of putting them in. I thought it could be a fun device. Mm -hmm. um, I was leery like, after... It took the e-book department an extra two weeks to get your book. You managed to get ready, I'm sure. Because <laughs> you live a brave! <laughs>